Good morning. It's good to be here with you. Um, every time I come here, it's a little trip down memory lane. Good memories here. And so glad to be back. Uh, open your Bibles uh, to John 3 or just listen as I read John chapter 3. Um, first part of John 3 is this famous conversation that Jesus has with Nick Demas. And uh, then in verse 22, it moves to this conversation between John the Baptist and some of his disciples. And they're talking about Jesus. And so I'll read that section, that conversation, starting verse 22. Remember, this is God speaking, so listen. John 3, verse 22. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside and remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because the water was plentiful there. And people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he's baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must decrease, but I must, or he must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard. Yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. That's where we'll end the reading of God's Word. This is God's Word which never passes away, may he open our hearts and our minds to receive it. Four years ago now, the iPhone 10 came out, and uh, the only reason I remember that is because uh, we watched the Winter Olympics four years ago. It's on again now, uh, but we watched the Winter Olympics four years ago, and uh, I managed to get NBC through, uh, through uh, an antenna that I connected to my TV, and uh, on NBC, they just replayed the same commercials again and again and again. And one of those commercials, um, which get seared into your memory over that time, was a, a, a commercial for iPhone X. Uh, this commercial highlighted one single feature of the phone. Uh, it's the phone's capacity to take great selfies. And if you want to get, take some good pictures of yourself, if you want the world to see and to notice you, then you need this phone. As the commercial scrolled through all the selfies uh, taken with the iPhone X, they played a fam that famous monologue by uh, a monologue of Cassius Clay, who became Muhammad Ali, where he says, I am the greatest. Very fitting for a commercial about selfies. In some ways, selfies encapsulates our culture of narcissism, which is simply the admiration of yourself or the desire to be admired. Uh, it's been around since the fall into sin, and so it's not a new thing, but with the advent of technology and social media, we have so many more uh, opportunities to feed that addiction. We want people to, in some way, somehow admire us. Now, I'm talking to a bunch of seminarians and seminary professors, and if you're anything like me, you're quite in the dark when it comes to social media. But we are not immune to the temptations of narcissism. Uh, especially when it comes to ministry. It's very easy to make ministry about yourself. And it's nice. It's a nice boost to the ego when people comment on your sermon or uh, repost something that you wrote or praise you in your work in some way. It makes you feel good. And when you don't get that stuff, it can be hard and discouraging, and you begin to doubt yourself, and, and your soul is troubled. How are you going to deal with that when that comes? How do you deal with that now? 
Here at the end of John chapter 3, we find the greatest prophet of the Old Testament era, John the Baptist. And if anyone could have secured their own following or built their own kingdom, if anyone could have gone as of the greatest of all times, it was John the Baptist. John the Baptist could have done it. But when presented with an opportunity to grab more influence and to gain more followers and to make his name great, he simply said, no, I must decrease and he must increase. John tells his disciples, don't you realize it? this isn't about me? It's always been about Jesus. The goal of John's ministry was to be forgotten so that Jesus would be remembered. And so he tells his disciples essentially to forget about him and to go follow Jesus. That reminds us that ministry isn't about us. It's not about how great your preaching or your shepherding or your writing is. It's not about how many followers you have or how many people have watched your sermon or listened to it or how big or how small of a church you serve because this simply isn't your show. And throughout ministry, you're going to be tempted to make it about you. And you're going to think that it's your show, and you're going to think it's your kingdom, and you're going to want the glory. And when you face that temptation, remember what the greatest prophet in the Old Testament said, I want to simply fade into the crowd so that Jesus is in the spotlight. If you want to truly minister, then get the ego out of the way because it's not about you. And make it your aim to be forgotten so that Jesus alone is exalted. There are basically two parts to this passage. Uh, there's one, a uh, perceived threat, and two, a godly response. A perceived threat and a godly response. So first, what's the perceived threat? Well, Jesus and his disciples were in the Judean countryside, and people were going to um, him and them to be baptized. Uh, a little farther north and east, John the Baptist was continuing his ministry of baptism, And at least up to this point, uh, people were coming to him in droves to be baptized. Well, the news spread that Jesus and his disciples were baptizing now. And one of John's disciples came up to John and said, Rabbi, he who was with you, uh, they don't even dignify him with using his name, but he who was with you when you were baptizing on the other side of the Jordan, the one to whom you bore witness, look, he's now baptizing and everyone's going to him. Well, what's their concern? Their concern is that Jesus is stealing your ministry. They saw Jesus as a threat. You're John the Baptist. Baptism is your thing. We should have patented this when we had a chance because this guy, this guy that you baptize, he's copying you. He's taking your thing. You're the one who made him who he is, and now this is how he he repays you. He he hijacks your, your tool, your baptism, and now he's taking your followers. What are we going to do about it? The perceived threat is that someone is ruining your ministry, ruining my influence, ruining my following. And you're going to have that temptation. You're going to face that temptation in ministry because you're going to want the praise of people and the acknowledgement that you're a good pastor. You're going to want the recognition. You're going to want to see those sermon audio numbers through the roof. You're going to crave those moments when someone says, wow, you're a good Pastor, what a great sermon. He's so good. And when we don't get that praise, we're going to feel like a failure. We're going to doubt ourselves, doubt our calling. We can grow bitter, resentful, and we can second guess what we're doing. When ministry becomes about us, the world becomes filled with a whole bunch of competition. And it becomes filled with rivals who threaten our ministry rather than co-laborers for the gospel. The perceived problem is that someone's out to ruin my kingdom. Well, how does John respond? He says, no. You're missing the whole point here. He must increase and I must decrease. And that's the godly response. He tells his disciples, don't don't you get it? You've been with me all this time and you've missed the whole point. My greatest hope and joy is to be forgotten so that Jesus alone is remembered. I'm happiest when I faded into the crowd and Jesus stands at the center of attention. That's the whole point of my ministry. There are really two parts to this godly response. First, he points out his humble position, and then he points out Jesus's exalted position. And so he starts by reminding his disciples about his humble position, and he mentions three things. 
He first says about himself, essentially, I am an employee, not the owner. He says in verse 27, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it's given to him from heaven. And what's he mean by that? Well, the disciples understood that John's ministry was something that he himself built from the ground up. Baptism was his thing. This was his kingdom, his following, his influence, his glory. But John says, no, this isn't my ministry. I don't have a kingdom. God's the owner. He's the king. And he's given me these things to do. He's entrusted me with the ministry of baptism and calling people to repentance to prepare the way for the Lord. The only reason why I have this ministry is because it was given to me. This isn't my kingdom. I'm not the king here. I'm a citizen. I'm not the owner. I'm an employee. The second thing he says about himself is that he says, I'm a servant and not a Christ. I'm a servant and not a Christ. John reminds them of what he told them earlier. Uh, When people came to John early on in John's ministry, they asked him, are you the Christ? And he said plainly, no, I'm not. I'm just a servant preparing the way for him. The whole purpose of my life is to prepare people to receive him. And so I'm not trying to get followers because I'm not the Savior. I'm a servant preparing people for the Savior. I exist in order to point people to him. So I'm a servant, not the Christ. And then the third thing he says is, I'm a friend and not the groom. I'm a friend and not the groom. I'm here to take care of the bride until the groom gets here. And now that he's here, it's my joy, my great joy to see people. It's my complete joy to see people run to him. So essentially, he's saying, I'm trying to work myself out of a job. You're, You're upset that people are following Jesus instead of me, but that's what my ministry is all about. And that's what gives me my greatest joy. You know, that moment in a wedding when the bride and groom have taken their vows and they've kissed and they're presented as Mr. and Mrs., Uh, The congregation erupts in praise, and not one person in the congregation is thinking about how great the best man is, because it has nothing to do with him. It's all about the bride and groom. And as those newlyweds walk down the aisle, and the congregation follows them as they walk down, all their backs are, guess what, to who? The best man. That's the moment John's talking about here. He says, this is the moment when I'm happiest. When everyone's back is to me and they're all looking at Jesus. I'm happiest when uh, I've faded away into the crowd and they're all looking at him. That's so different, so opposite from our narcissistic tendencies. It's so easy to find our hearts to be most joyful when we receive the praise of people. When they follow me, when they comment on my sermon, when they like my ministry. And it's easy to think that our ministries belong to us in some way. And we try to gain more citizens and grow a following and stretch our influence and wanting more people to come to our churches. And when that happens, it makes us feel good. But when that doesn't happen or when we see others prosper, we can grow envious. We can think the worst. When others fall, uh, our hearts can silently rejoice because that means that we have one less competitor never be. Your ministry, whatever it looks like, whatever it produces, it's not yours. It's not ours. It's not mine. It's God's. We're just stewards of it. We're servants of the King and entrusted by God with this ministry. So don't let your ministry be about you. Don't preach hoping that they'll put up plaques after you're gone or that your name will be remembered as one of the greats but make it your goal that after all the dust is settled after your ministry, that your name is sort of just simply forgotten so that the name of Jesus alone is remembered. I must decrease. After John reminds them of his humble position, he then reminds his disciples of Jesus' exalted position. And in these last verses of this chapter, John simply exalts Jesus. The disciples, remember, are, they're accusing Jesus of stealing John's ministry. And if John, um, as if it was John who made Jesus into who he was, and then Jesus steals his thing and steals his followers. And so he's simply affirming to his disciples, Jesus is the one who's great here. And so six quick things that he, he points out. First, Jesus is above all, verse 31. Jesus, who came down from, a, from heaven, is above all. I didn't make him who he is. 
He made me who I am. I'm his servant. Baptism is his thing. My ministry comes from him. Second thing, Jesus brings you to God. Verse 33, whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. And what that means is that if you're following Jesus, you're affirming that God is true and that Jesus is the true God. Jesus alone brings you to God. You can't bring anyone to God. So instead of cultivating a loyalty to you, build up in your people a loyalty to Jesus because he alone is the path, of God, the path to God. Third thing, he says, Jesus alone speaks the words of God. Uh, verse 24 says that he was sent by God uttering the very words of God. You know, as good as your sermons may be, as good as you exegete and explain and illustrate and apply, your goal isn't to get people to try to remember how powerful your sermons are, your words are, or, or to get, uh, but, but simply your goal is to get people to understand how great his words are. That's the goal of preaching to exalt the words of Christ. So don't let people, don't work to see people exalt your words above Christ's words. For Jesus alone speaks the words of God because he was sent by God. Fourth, Jesus gives his spirit. The end of verse 34 says he gives the spirit without measure. He not only gives you his word, but he gives you his spirit so that you can understand it. Uh, remember, John said earlier, I baptize with water, but he baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I can do the symbol. He's the only one who can do the reality. Jesus gives the Spirit. Fifth, he says, Jesus has all authority. Verse 35, the Father loves the Son and gives all things into his hand. All power and authority was given to him. He's crowned as the king, which means that this is his kingdom and it's built by his power and it's all for his glory. I'm just a servant. I'm a citizen to shine the light on him. And then sixth and last, John says, only he can save. Verse 36 says that only Jesus can save you from the wrath and grant you uh, the wrath of God and grant you eternal life. It's amazing how easy it is to get this mixed up, but we are not saviors. You can't fix anyone, and no one can actually fix you except Jesus. And so don't act like a savior in your ministry. Don't create a dependence upon you but help people learn to depend on Jesus for he alone, he alone, he alone can save. Amen. John's message is loud and clear. This is not about me. It's always about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's always been about Jesus. So follow him because he's the greatest. Don't make your ministry about you. Make it about Jesus and when the dust settles, make it your goal to be forgotten so that Jesus is lifted high. I saw a movie some years ago. It's a Turkish movie um, called The Mountain 2, and I really liked it. Um, it's about Turkish special forces uh, in their fight against the Taliban. And one of my, uh, the, my, my, the, my favorite part of that movie was when these special forces soldiers, they graduated uh, after their training, and their commander spoke to them, and he said this. He said, our aim is to be forgotten, unknown. Our names won't be carved into stone. They won't sing songs about us. For if we gather fame, that means we failed. Our nature is to utterly serve the Turkish people. As you graduate from here, you enter into ministry. Remember, it's our aim to be forgotten. Our names won't be carved into stone. No one's going to sing songs about you. Our calling is to utterly serve the Lord so that people sing of him. He must increase. I must decrease. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that you have made this Jesus both Lord and Christ, and so we humbly bow to him. And Lord Jesus, you are above all. You have the words of God. You give the spirit of God. You have all authority and only you can save. You are the king of kings and this is your kingdom. And we are your servants in this kingdom. Forgive us when we fall into that temptation, when we make this all about ourselves, when we try to build our own kingdom and gather our own following and gain our own glory and receive our own praise. Please help us to constantly reorient to constantly walk in repentance, to reorient our thoughts 
in order to bury our pride and to seek to be forgotten so that you alone are remembered. We are your servants. This is your kingdom built by your power, all for your glory. And together we say, amen.